Let's start here with your U.S. operations, because you are a major player here in the U.S., including when it comes to LNG. And, of course, the White House just recently announced that pause on pending project approvals. Your Rio Grande project is already in the construction process, so that one won't be impacted. But how does this impact your operations overall? Uh, first, yes, it's true that we have very large operations in LNG. We are the uh, largest uh, exporter from U.S. LNG, more than 10 million tons last year. And we intend to, uh, to consolidate it through some new projects. Uh, we produce today LNG in Cameron, uh, uh, but we will uh, have these new projects in South Texas, Rio Grande. As you said, we have already authorizations. My comment on this decision is that it's, uh, for me, uh, immediately it has no impact, but it's more a matter of trust, you know. Uh, in energy, uh, security of supply is fundamental. And, uh, you know, Europe today uh, uh, is uh, facing a shift in its way to import gas. It was Russian gas. We are shifting quite in a large way to uh, U.S. LNG. And there is no free trade agreement between Europe and the U.S., unfortunately. So if uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, the government is uh, suddenly deciding to put on hold some exports to non-free trade agreement, it could be damaging for security of supply to Europe. So I think it's a temporary measure which will have no immediate impact. But again, uh, I think it's uh, trust is fundamental in these big energy uh, transfers. And for Europe, it would be a pity to go from, I would say, uh, uh, a lack of trust from Russian gas to uh, an issue with uh, U.S. energy. So I'm sure Things will come, and the best way, by the way, will be to have a, a special agreement to be sure that U.S. energy can be exported to Europe, whatever uh, policies are here in the U.S. Does it at all make you question your future in the U.S. and whether or not you would enter new LNG projects? Not really, because, you know, we are one of the second largest uh, U.S. Uh, pro LNG, sorry, sorry, LNG producer worldwide, and U.S. LNG might, might have many destinations. So Rio Grande has started. It's a big project, uh, $17 billion. It will be delivered, the LNG will be delivered by 27, 28. So, uh, you know, it's a long-term view that we have. But uh, uh, we have other projects, for, for, ex for example, expansion of Cameron, uh, to a new train, and obviously uh, we'll need to have some comfort uh, before to launch an additional project. So, uh, but I trust that uh, uh, this, uh, I would say, temporary review will be positive because, again, by the way, uh, the U.S. Uh, LNG is also contributing to the energy transition worldwide. You know, uh, one of the big fights we have globally uh, for the climate is uh, to shift from coal-fired power plant to gas-fired power plants. And so gas, and in particular the U.S. gas, is really a, a key uh, factor for making this transition real. That's why, by the way, for Total Energies, all strategy is based on two pillars. One is uh, gas, an energy, tra uh, an energy trans transition in uh, energy, and the other part is renewables. And this is exactly uh, the strategy we develop here in the U.S., in particular in Texas, uh, where we have uh, large uh, LNG plants, but also uh, we are investing uh, in large uh, renewable plants thanks to the uh, ERA. Now, you've spent billions uh, building out your LNG portfolio, and there is not a lot of new capacity coming online in the next few years. But by the end of the decade, some are now saying that the market could be oversupplied as these new projects are finally built. Do you think that we could see a different pricing environment towards the end of the decade? And do you think the market will be oversupplied? For sure, you know, it's a cyclical business, you know. Uh, today and for 24, 25 and probably 26, we are really in tension. Because, you know, last year uh, with the war uh, in Europe, suddenly uh, Europe has decided to uh, import 50 million tons more of LNG. It's a huge number because the global market, worldwide market is 400 million tons. So it has a big impact. The price have rocketed. They are a little lower this year, uh, because again, there is no additional supply coming on stream for the next two, two, four, two years. Next, this year in 24, it will be less than 8 million tons, so it's nothing. Uh, and uh, that means the market is in tension. But of course, when you have new uh, market is high, new projects will come. And again, the cycle will begin. At a certain point, there will be uh, more capacities than immediate demand. But what I've observed in this business for the last 10 years, First, the growth of demand is 10% per year as an average, in particular when prices are lower. So I would, I would say uh, prices, more reasonable prices, around uh, $8, $10 per million BTU for LNG in Asia, is really pushing the demand up. 
And that's, so that's why we have cycles. So yes, more capacities will come on stream. And from this perspective, we could see the pools in the US is not a bad thing. But at the same time, uh, when gas prices are lower, the demand is booming. And so it's good. And then you have another cycle. So that's why we are in this business. Uh, because uh, there is volatility, but uh, the strength of Total Energy is, is to have a worldwide business with a strong, very strong balance sheet. It's a company uh, of $150 billion with no debt, uh, which can afford this volatility and take benefit from arbitrage between the different regions of the world in order to direct the US energy either to Europe or to Asia, according to uh, the growing markets. And I want to ask you about oil prices as well, because we've seen growing tensions in the Middle East. But so far, oil has almost shrugged off uh, any threats there. And so, you know, do you think that the market is underappreciating this risk of an escalation in the Middle East? I think there are different trends in the oil markets. It's true that we are more stable, about $80 per barrel. Uh, I think the tensions are supportive, clearly, of the oil price. You have a feeling in the market that in 24, uh, there will be a good supply coming from non-OPEC countries, in particular the US, Brazil, Guyana, uh, and that the OPEC, uh, you know, just recently, Saudi Arabia announced that they will limit their production, their maximum capacity, 12 million barrels of oil per day instead of 13. So there is a more difficulty for the producers of the OPEC and OPEC Plus to control the supply. And at the same time, you know, we have a sort of a gloomy uh, macro environment on the demand. Even if in 24 again, the demand will grow uh, according to IEA projection by 1.2 million barrels of oil per day, 1.2%, which is the average of the last 20 years. So there is no surprise. So that's, uh, I would say, some uncertainty between the balance between demand and supply, not like in 23, where the demand grew by 2 million barrels of oil per day because of recovery from COVID, in particular in China, and the jet fuels. Uh, but at the same time, we have this tension. You are right, these tensions are real risk. We've seen the risk, uh, reality of the risk in the strait of the Bam el Mandeb strait, where today we don't use any more uh, any of our tankers, no LNG tankers are going through the straits. And of course, this risk could expand. So that could push the price of oil prices higher in the coming weeks. But I hope people will find a way to, to calm down the risk. And are those diversions through, and not going through the Baba Mandab Strait, is that impacting your operations? And for how long can the market sustain the higher shipping costs that come with tankers rerouting? You're now just going around uh, Africa, it's four days more, four days more. So it's not a big, so big uh, impact. It has a small impact on the cost of transportation. But the uh, oil and gas industry is not a just-in-time industry, you know, uh, like car manufacturing. So we have large storage. Uh, and so these additional four days do not really impact the delivery of energy, for example, to Europe, either on oil or, or gas. But it, uh, it is adding a cost, an additional cost, after having all the Russian ban, so it's, make, it puts, it's pushed today and we can observe it. The price of petroleum products, of refined products, are, are clearly going up because of these either transportation costs or insurance costs for those who decide to go through, uh, through the Red Sea. So, uh, yes, we can. I think there is no impact on the supply, but all that has a cost and that's pushing again, the supporting higher energy prices. And you mentioned that decision by Saudi Arabia to dial back on their maximum production from 13 million barrels per day to more in the 12 million barrel per day target. What do you think that says about long term demand and what they're forecasting, you know, oil demand growth will look like looking forward? I'm not sure it has a uh, real view on the long term. You know, it's more that they had to take a decision on a very large projects. Uh, which was heavy oil projects. Obviously, uh, the Saudis are very disciplined in the way they apply their quota. They are the leaders of OPEC. And I think uh, from an economic point of view, uh, growing again the capacity at a time where, in fact, they have a quota which allows to produce 9, 10 million barrels of per day was making little economic sense. So I remember that uh, Aramco is now a, a listed company. So I think it's maybe we should not, I think, uh, go beyond uh, an economic decision Having said that, uh, this oil in Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, they benefit from the cheapest oil in the planet. Uh, they can produce it onshore with less than $2, $2 $3 per barrel. So they, they know that they will be somewhere the, uh, the oil producer of the long-term future. So uh, I, shouldn't, I should not think it's more, I think, uh, 
on the short, medium term, immediate uh, action on the market to send a signal and to continue to control the uh, OPEC and OPEC plus production. And one of the themes we've seen playing out in maybe the last year is this large scale M&A. Of course, we had Exxon and Pioneer and Chevron and Hess and Total Energies has done some smaller deals. But would you be interested in following the majors into a, a very big ticket deal? Uh, no, no, because, you know, these deals have been linked uh, fundamentally. Why? Because we are not in the shale oil uh, business, you know, in the U.S. We are in energy and renewables and uh, offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, but we are not in this business. And so I understand what happens in the U.S. You have a consolidation of a quite a fragmented shale industry. Uh, I think it's good uh, to have a more efficient way to produce these shale oil. So uh, the uh, U.S. players are... I would say merging. It's, I think when you look to the history of oil, oil industry, it has been like that. You had, I would say, uh, some vibrant industry, many players who uh, discovered all this shale oil, and now you have a consolidation is to, in order to be more efficient. Uh, having said that, I would say, unlike for Saudi Arabia, there is a signal to the market, you know, is that, uh, and we should be careful because this consolidation, whatever this means, it means also more rationalization in, in the way the capex will be spent in shale oil. So it could have an impact on the global capacity of oil, like for Saudi Arabia. And I think if I'm thinking to the future of the oil price, we see today a, a situation where, in fact, more and more the supply is constrained. And when the supply is constrained and as the population is growing and the demand continues to grow, this again will contribute to higher prices. So I think all these moves um, are in fact going in the same direction, including with the energy transition where we invest less in oil. This might be, uh, because again there is a gro continuous growing demand, uh, a, a support to higher prices for oil in the future. And your strategy, and uh, as well as the strategy of some of your European peers, has been to build out your energy transition investments a lot more than the American companies, the American giants have. And for a while there, when commodity prices were high, your valuation, your stock suffered potentially because of that. You know, do you think at a certain point investors will recognize that your dual pronged approach and maybe reward you more for your efforts on the integrated power side of things? I hope so. And I think we are demonstrating that with our reserves of 23. You know, we are building a, quite a new uh, business, uh, what we, a power business inside the, our company. Uh, why did we decide that strategy? It's because when you think to the long term future with the energy transition, we think that at a certain point, all demand might plateau and even should decline. Uh, gas, as, as I said, is quite a good energy transition. That's why we are strong on LNG. But the growing energy uh, in order to decarbonize, I would say, globally the world is uh, electricity. We need more electricity, uh, in particular from renewables, but also from flexible assets, batteries, gas, fire power plants. That's fundamental. So we decided that we should position, because in the company, uh, on these third energy, electricity, uh, because, you know, it's a long-term industry. So the decision you don't do, uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, catch up. So we have to engage. We are spending today $5 billion per year. Uh, but we are also demonstrating to the market for 2023 results that we can do both together. It's an end strategy. It's oil and gas on one side and electricity renewables on the other side. Why do I say that? Because we are the most profitable major company on the top, 19% of return on capital employed. And so we can do both. And our new business in integrated power has delivered more than $2 billion, which after five years of implementing this strategy, I think is quite a, a good result. So I think we can, Total Energy's ambition is to demonstrate that it's uh, Yes, oil and gas and uh, integrated power. It's, in fact, the energy of today that you need as consumers and preparing the energy for tomorrow. That's our, our strategy. And I'm convinced that the market will recognize the value of it. In particular, even if there are some doubts sometimes in the markets about the profitability of renewables. But again, what we deliver, it's electrons, firm, clean electrons or, or customers. And we have reached on this segment, this year, where we publish our results, more 10% of return on capital employed. So it's not very different than the uh, uh, profitability of my oil and gas business at $60 per barrel, $50, $60 per barrel. So all in all, I think it's just adding an additional source of cash and betting on a growing market, in particular in, in the U.S., 
where we have uh, building a very strong uh, integrated power system in Texas, in the ERCOT market, uh, with different uh, tools, including acquiring recently some gas-fired power plants. And when you talk about this and strategy of both oil and gas and renewables, there was a recent report from Reuters that said your Total Energies is exploring a sale of some of your U.S. and European renewable projects worth about two and a half billion. Can you comment on that? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's very clear. It's a very uh, assumed strategy. You know, we we uh, built all our projects on a 100 percent basis uh, when we operate then. But uh, we have assumed that uh, we will farm down 50 percent of all our projects. Why? Uh, first, because there is a good market, and so it will enhance the profitability of this business. But more importantly to me, it's a risk management. We prefer to have two times 50 percent of two projects and one time 100 percent on one project. If there is any issues, technical issues, so we prefer to spread our risk. It's a way, by the way, we manage the world total energies company globally in all our businesses. And so there is nothing new in that report. The reality is that uh, this amount that you mentioned demonstrates that we are growing very quickly. In Texas, we have, in fact, we will put into production in 24 around two gigawatts of new plants. And so the farm down activity will be higher. But again, it's part of the business model. So uh, our ambition is to uh, build by 2030 uh, to contribute to build 100 gigawatts of different uh, uh, solar, wind, offshore wind plants. But we will have 50 gigawatts in net at the end of the decade. So that's an assumed strategy. And again, it's risk management and better profitability. And then finally, I do have to ask you about offshore wind in the U.S. because you are developing projects, including off the coast of New Jersey. And that comes at a time when we've seen a host of cancellations. So are you confident that these projects will actually come to fruition and, and why these ones when others have been canceled? Uh, you know why? Because we are a little late. In fact, we took the sort of concession two years ago, so we have been uh, working hard on that. And uh, no, we are really very happy with what happened with the last, uh, I would say, uh, auctions. We have been awarded two good contracts, $130 uh, per megawatt hour in New Jersey, uh, uh, I, including, of course, we have to build all the connections to, to the land. I think it's, it's a quite a, it's an interesting business, you know, and uh, we would not have given that offer if it was not meeting our profitability target. So the debate about offshore wind came, in fact, from earlier mover, who, in fact, were more, too optimistic. They uh, took some contracts a few years ago at lower prices, too low. And so they have just have, I think, not to cancel, but to rebuild their, their projects in order to get the same conditions that we got. But what I've observed is that either with, uh, in New York with the nice SEDA regulator or in New Jersey, both uh, states were very keen to get this offshore wind electricity, in particular because it's creating local jobs, you know. And uh, so we will implement in this, uh, in this region, in the northeast of uh, the U.S., some uh, new uh, turbine plants with uh, some partners. And, uh, and I think it's also a driver behind it. And I would say that, of course, the IRA has been quite a good support to make this project profitable. And so uh, from this perspective, I think it's a, it's a good uh, legislation, good piece of legislation, because it's allow us to deploy this project, this capital in the US. It's very large projects, and three gigawatt offshore to represent $10 billion, more or less, or more than that. So it's a large investment, but of course, it's meeting our profitability targets. Uh, uh, at the Total Energies level. Patrick Puyane, CEO of Total Energies, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, people.